My task today, I take to be a little different from the title I offered Christine some months ago when I was asked to contribute to the, uh, to the uh, program. Namely, I want to ask what I think is a more fundamental question, which is how feminists should approach political settlement uh, in the way that Laura Semple articulates as uh, valuing equality and inclusion uh, in a way that interrogates structural hierarchies and in ways that examine intersecting forms of oppression. In parallel, I start from the assumption that theories constructed by men, about men, <coughs> assuming masculinities, as I will affirm that much of the foundational political settlement, settlement literature does, are partial, not only because they leave out women as people, but also they leave out substantive considerations related to femininity. At most basic, I'm going to suggest to us today that gender analysis is crucial to understanding the presence and absence, the meaning of and the representation <coughs> of women in political settlements. I, I come to this place, as many of you or those of you at least who know my work, as a critical feminist theorist who's seeking to identify and discover the implications of genderings in political settlement space. The work, I think, I'm going to use Spike Peterson's terms, is neither just about women, nor about the addition of women to male stream consciousness. It's about transforming ways of being and ways of knowing. So I want to start with a couple of presumptions. First and foremost, that gendering political settlements requires us to understand political form as being about gender, but not always about women. This starts from a very simple move that will be familiar to many of you. It starts by recognizing and stopping the conflation of the term women and gender, which happens across a wide range of communities, from neoconservative pundits to radical feminists. Um, we see, or I see, this interchangeability most often and probably most pronounceably today in the discourses connected to violence against women and sexual violence in conflict, something I'm going to return to later. I want us to be alert that this same danger of conflating women and gender is being undertaken around the gender interface with political settlement. Um, there's an obvious and uh, clear slide to essentialism in this slippage. And I think what we need to do instead is to comprehensively gender an analysis of political settlement. And that requires us seeing men as gendered. I, I also start from the assumption, as I've said before, that the terrain of political settlement is deeply, profoundly, and inherently gendered. Political settlement, as I will explore further in my remarks today, uh, is a structure that affirms, recognizes, values, and <coughs> valorizes the masculine, and ignores, sidelines, and dismisses the feminine. Central to the gendering of political settlement terrain, as I see it, is understanding that political settlement, like many other sites, and in this I include peace agreements, I include constitutional settlements, I include legal negotiations, um, are sites in which subordination is an active process. Um, drawing most significantly on the work of Laura Schoberg, I argue that one of the key aspects of gender subordination is the devaluation of traits and values associated with femininities. And that gender subordination has to be addressed in part by finding a pathway to the point where people and values associated with femininity are, quote, in, in Schoberg's terms, more universally valued in public life. And that women's agency in their decisions is recognized as men's agency is in theirs. Um, it's best, I think, though somewhat controversial, um, not to see gender subordination as something that men do to women, or even that women do to women, but to understand it as a result of systematic discursive frameworks of expectations and power based on perceived membership in sex categories. So gender relations in political settlement, I think, are about a set of intersecting relationships. And it's in these relationships that I claim that institutional hierarchies are naturalized by feminization and thus effectively depoliticized. 
where feminization as devalorization intersects with race, with ethnicity, with class, as Eilish discussed yesterday, with nationality, and with other cleavages. Gender is relational. Um, and it privileges what is masculinized and, uh, and extricably, inextricably devalues what is feminized. So when we think about putting women into political settlement, it's, it's requiring us to do something far more simply than think about modalities, about how to get them in there. But it's understanding the set of pre-deeply rooted assumptions, structures, uh, that uh, foreground that inclusion, that actually um, shape what you're including in. Um, so, as in political settlement, just like in any other space, uh, the popular misconception that gender is reducible to biological maleness or femaleness, or the traits that go along with biological uh, configurations, have to be, uh, I think, uh, abandoned. Uh, male bodies and female bodies are expected to contain masculine and feminine people who fill their gender roles in orderly ways. This is no less true in peace settlement uh, in other spaces than it is in political settlement space. So those are some framings. I also want to talk about something um, called gender orders. So we talked a lot about political orders yesterday and the centrality of relating political orders to political settlement. And um, I want to focus a little bit on gendered orders and their centrality to political settlement practice. Gendered orders are produced by and reinforced by gender normative understandings of what people do and should do and how they live and how they act. And they can't be divorced from how life is actually lived and actually experienced. These two things are deeply and profoundly connected. Gender orders, as I and other feminist scholars have suggest, I in this context, normalize the marginalization, the subordination, and the exploitation of feminized practices or persons, such that routinized feminization can be associated with routine devalorization. It's important to underscore that feminization is not limited to those people who are female or who are understood to be female. It also extends to men who behave or are seen to behave like women. It also extends to states, processes, and other actors who display or are seen to display traits associated with femininity. So the key point here is not simply to see feminization as embodied in the female body, but understanding feminization as devalorization, operating in institutions, in processes, and in structures. Um, and so that beyond that, we have to think about concepts, desires, tastes, styles, ways of knowing, ways of being, both in the everyday sense and in the social, global, social, and political sense as being feminized. And seeing that feminization and what happens to it when it's imported into structural form, whether it's in political settlement or peace agreement or any other process. And um, I think when we take that framing, that macro framing, as a way of understanding uh, political settlement practice, just like we might understand any other practice, uh, we understand more acutely its effect on organizations, on people, on actors, on behaviors, on processes. And we understand the high compulsion to conformity with gender-sensitive borders and things um, that conform to type, as it were. And effectively, what this requires us to be sensitive to, to be acutely aware of, is the valorization and centrality of the masculine in space, in time, in institutions, in processes, and in practices. And the corresponding devalorization of the, and marginalization of the feminine. And so we could think about even the papers we talked about yesterday, the ways in which uh, those practices reflect a set of uh, masculine uh, uh, gender orders, if you want. The second thing I want us to take away from the application of that macro understanding of uh, masculinities and femininities in political as well as personal space 
is that gender operates in profoundly hierarchical ways uh, in, um, in global political practice. And by extension, it operates in highly hierarchical ways in political settlement practice. So that's really my start, is for us to think about at this sort of macro level, the kind of macro understandings of um, or the relevance of theory, theorization, um, before we go to the particular. So let me go to the particular. I'm going to take a set of random examples. Um, some of them work better than others. So, um, so I'm going to talk about what I see as a set of practices that relate to this um, macro framing. And the first I'm going to call just warriors and beautiful souls um, for following me. So, uh, as many of you will know, gender and conflict scholars such as Jean Elstein have chronicled the ways in which both men and women are pigeonholed by gender and ideal type expectations uh, in the way that women behave and men behave in war and conflict. <coughs> I think this kind of um, pigeonholing or this ideal type expectation can also be extended to our understanding of the conflict, post-conflict, peace agreement, and political settlement <coughs> context. For Elstein, she saw the stereotype of the just warrior as mostly, but not exclusively, being applied to men, and bound deeply bound up with tropes of honor and protection. And um, women, on the other hand, are the beautiful souls that they protect. And uh, that protection, uh, uh, that sort of uh, engagement between the warrior and the beautiful soul um, has been described by a number of feminist scholars, IR scholars, as a protection racket. And what they mean by the protection racket is the chauvinistic pretensions uh, to protect women in war, which underpin a war logic and is rarely actualized in war fighting. And I think there's a similar echo uh, to claims about inclusion to women in peace and political settlement processes, that these same tropes of protectionism uh, kind of weave their way through the rationales which underscore uh, how women should be included. There are, I think, as many in this room have recorded, Christine and Catherine included, the idea that some essentialized notion of women makes for better purer, reconstructed politics. Uh, a whole set of essentialized tropes about the feminine in the space of political settlement. Um, but these motifs of um, warrior and beautiful soul, I think, have a funny way of traveling, right? So see where they go. Um, and in recent decades, I think, uh, the place where they've traveled the most is into the place where there's been the most heat around women in conflict and post-conflict um, regulation, which is around violence, primarily sexual violence, and most notably penetrative sexual violence, usually rape. Um, and so we've seen as a as a as a sort of a, as that as those experiences of uh, 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 of sexual violence for women have moved to center stage in the discussions around uh, conflict and peace. Uh, gender justice has become much more central to the discussion of post-conflict settlement. Um, and I and others in the room have addressed this move quite substantially in our work. Um, but let me say again that this move, which has um, identified sexual violence as the crux of women's sort of identity in conflict space, and has then moved to remedy that through peace and conflict mediation processes, uh, is really quite problematic in a number of ways. Um, and those motifs of problematics can be mapped onto the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which um, I have done in prior work. Um, and I want to say why they're important, uh, why they're problematic just briefly. Um, because it forces us to ask the question, how is it that women become visible to conflict processes and to conflict resolving processes? What are the essentialisms that promote that engagement with the woman, qua women? And what are the consequences of that space being the hot point of engagement? And the consequences are that in a seemingly liberal move, or what or some have called it in a lib an illiberal move to the carceral politics of international conflict feminism, 
Uh, we've certainly brought women into play. What we've brought them into play was considerable costs. And the costs are, first, about that being the hot spot. Why is it that the battered female body is the body of most interest? Um, when we do so in an odd way, we go back, I want to take us back to the starting point around masculinities and femininities. We inherently valorize the beautiful souls. We inherently focus our, the, the primary goal of process in protecting women. And by doing so, we subordinate agency, resistance, capacity, and the ability to step outside of those tropes for women. So in an odd way, that center point functions to do uh, highly retrograde things, notwithstanding the compulsion to engage in these issues given the harms that women experience. Um, so um, I think that's one place to think about how, what have been the, what have been the prompts that have brought women into discussion in political settlement. And where, if we think, even if we were to think about our programmatic engagement across all of the partners, the extent to which violence, albeit important, uh, remains a hot spot for identifying women as an entry point um, to political settlement. And so the second practice I want to focus on is vocabulary, the vocabulary of political uh, settlement and, and the ways in which the vocabulary of political settlement um, is both inclusive and exclusive. This piece of my comment today is actually pretty well set out in the paper I shared with you, so um, I'm going to try to shortcut it. Um, so those of you who want to read more of the detail uh, and my micro-analysis of all the definitions could do so on the paper. And so it's really clear, as uh, we've talked about yesterday, that a stable meaning for political settlement remains somewhat of a work in progress, although contours of a core and a penumbra are engaging. Uh, we know that Diffid's uh, definition is a broad one, quote, the expression of a common understanding usually forged between elites on how power is organized and exercised. So these definitions, um, uh, I think, offer us a starting point to sort of see where do women uh, where's gender fit in the definition of framing? Um, and part of the, uh, the interesting thing is at the heart of this loose consensus on the meaning of political settlement is the idea that there might be some scope for greater inclusivity, which is the kind of negotiating inclusion strapline that Christine um, uh, alluded to or framed yesterday. Um, and so when we talk about inclusion, inclusion raises the sort of possibility or the specter of a transformative political space in which women might be present on equal terms with men, and that men could behave in non-prescriptive ways in that space, in gender non-conforming ways, that would in fact be valorized and appreciated in inclusivity. But I remain highly skeptical as to whether or not political settlement can deliver any better on that promise than other areas have, including peace agreements, the UN uh, WPS agenda, uh, and many others. So there's an assumption, and it was an assumption that pervaded much of our conversation yesterday, that the term political settlement is gender blind. But there's really very little analysis <coughs> as to whether it is or it isn't. There are a whole range of overlapping literatures that I've chronicled in the paper that you've read. And some of those literatures point to overlaps with uh, areas where there's been uh, significant literature, including Christine and Catherine's peace agreement literature, uh, literature on feminist, feminist literature on political participation, political process, uh, a, a recent body of gender and state building literature. There's some overlap there. But there's really, I think, a dearth of thinking as to whether or not the definition of political settlement functions to include or exclude women, both formally and informally, and how the dynamics of gender power, gender inequality, and gender exclusion function in political settlement. Um, the presumption that political settlement oper operates as a category that embraces women or gender non-conforming men has to be critically interrogated from the outset. Uh, and this brings me back to the gender orders discussion I framed the conversation with today, which is that it's not clear at all that it does. Um, what we need to understand, I think, better is the degree of emerging, how the 
emerging practice of political settlement comes with well-established gender norms, the gender orders that I've described in opening my conversation today. How these norms operate in political settlement practice um, and how the embedded ways of doing things exclude women even as we think we're including them or exclude gender non-conforming men uh, even as we think we're including them. Um, so I think there's a huge piece of work to be done to think about the presumptions that simply having, as, and we've done this work in peace building and peace, uh, peace agreement literature, but simply having women at the table means anything at all. As many of us in many different processes know, there's a huge amount of skepticism as to whether that's the case. Uh, my third area of practice that I want to focus my comments on is elites. Um, and so that word has sort of seeped through both the definition of the literature, which I surveyed in the paper, it's, it's seeped through the conversations, many of the papers we discussed yesterday. Um, and so we know that there's a concentrated value place in political settlement discourse on elite engagement. And that concentrated uh, value has some very obvious constraints for gender analysis. Um, the emphasis on elites confirms the kinds of gendered fault lines that I think have emerged and become entrenched in political settlement practice. It goes without saying that understanding the role of elites, we, should, we shouldn't and won't, I think, in this room, uh, foreclose the complexity of contending elites, of inter-elite bargaining, and the shifting and tenuous status of elites in many uh, combustible conflict sites. But when we reflect further on the centrality of elite engagement in political uh, settlement processes, we ultimately have to contend with the insider and outsider dynamics that are manifest when advantage accrues consistently to system insiders, to those with accumulated military prowess and with the inbuilt historical, colonial, and other advantages of racial wealth and property-based benefits in the existing status quo. The overlap of these concentrations of power with a gender order is indisputable and has gone hand in hand with the exclusion of women and non-gender conforming men from exercising political, economic and social power in a broad range of contexts. So gender exclusion is a huge problem that we have to contend with in the focus on elite, the elite concentration of political settlement theory and practice. And and I think it's also recognizing that the selective inclusion of elite women whose claims to presence may rest on an indisputable relationship with an elite powerful man, man or men in a clan-based system, may disguise the unrestrained entrenchment of a masculine worldview with a veneer of female legitimacy. Nothing in the gender order changes when that's how we think, when, when that's where inclusion gets us to. And so we may end up with the singular problem that feminist sociologist Carl, Carl Smart described as challenging a form of power without accepting its own terms of reference and hence losing the battle before it's begun. Okay. Um, I also just would say that I think the emphasis in the literature on maintaining and the buy-in of elites uh, which, has, which dominates much of the political settlement literature um, has very significant consequences for women. Um, the emphasis, this emphasis on maintaining that buy-in will, I think, ab of missio serve to exclude women whose political, economic and social capital is consistently lesser than men in most societies most of the time. Okay. Uh, let me say something about uh, institutionalism and power, power sharing, and then I think I'll stop and move to conversation. And um, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, starting from Cynthia Enloe's notion about um, having a feminist curiosity about the ways in which outcomes and institutional preferences serve the dynamic and shifting power relationships of elite men with one another, but rarely operate in service to the needs and dynamic interests of women, is my starting point when I think about institutionalism. And one of the things uh, that in 
particular I've been uh, sort of influenced by in this area of thinking is the role of feminist institutionalist scholars, Georgina Whelan, who's on the board of the Political Settlement Project, Louise Chappell and others, um, is thinking about the ways in which power is exercised both formally and particularly informally within political institutions. Um, it's, I think, particularly interesting to think about how women both try to affect the formal and informal rules of the game, and uh, where do they fit when they try to do so, what kind of strategies do women use to come into these settings, um, and what are their, what is the sort of institutional life of women and non-gender conforming men like in spaces of political settlement, political bargaining. And here, feminist institutional scholars have told us and reminded us that we have to take really seriously the idea of the social stuff of political process and political institutions. That that social stuff really matters to understanding how power is articulated, uh, retained, and displayed. And this social stuff includes a number of things. It can, includes the performative entry points to close bargaining spaces. It includes the social capital necessary for identification with the salient, salient markers of elite identity. It includes networking capacity, as well as access to and free movement from institutional power arenas. And all of these things require us to look at look within, not just look at the entry point in, but look at what's actually happening within institutions uh, uh, and, the, and processes. And um, for the formal and informal practices, these unwritten rules and expectations, to think about how and why women and non-gender conforming men include, uh, in, uh, engage in institutional process and in political settlement process. And what the institutional feminist scholars tell us, and I think are right to do so, is that when we pay attention to what's happening in those spaces, we understand far better the kinds of constraints and limitations that foreclose capacity to effectively exercise power. Um, and so it's in particular, I think, understanding the gaps that exist for women between formal and informal power that are critical to understanding how and why it is that political settlement may fail to deliver, even when women look like they've been formally included. And um, it is in that informal space, these socially shared rules, these unwritten, uncommunicated enforced rules that happen outside officially <coughs> sanctioned channels to which women have little or no real access. Um, and what, what close attention to these practices, and I think in the context of political settlement we're mostly looking at processes, um, uh, what they reveal is what Anne-Marie Goetz describes as gender capture, which follows from men's historical and modern dominance of political power within political and organizational structures. And so that underscores for me the point that even when women gain access, formal access to elite spaces through gender mainstreaming or through you know, multifarious kind of smart kind of access points or maneuvering to get yourself into the space, um, that their capacity to change the institutional rules of the game, how the deals get done and who makes them, may be absolutely limited. Okay, finally, let me just say a couple of words about ag agency, because I think there's, obviously, everybody needs a coffee now, and you're all really depressed. And I feel like that too, so. Um, I, think one of, <laughs> I, I think there's a challenge that we spend, and I think many people in this room have spent a lot of time maneuvering. We spend their lives maneuvering to figure out ways to find that little space between these two big spaces to access. And uh, I think I was having a conversation yesterday um, with one of our participants about fatigue, feminist fatigue, is a real, uh, uh, what Shireen Rao, call, uh, Rao calls um, gender depletion, the cost of constant engagement in these processes in ways that uh, consistently um, uh, where the affirmations are few and the wins are small. 
And so I think there's a way in which we can become overwhelmed by that, both as a matter of advocacy, as a matter of strategizing, even as a matter of theorizing. So I do want to finish by talking about agency. And so, least we forget, one of the most powerful contributions of feminist theorizing in the peace and security arena in recent years has been our sustained emphasis on the power, resilience, and agency of female actors, and of some, albeit small number, of non-gender conforming men in conflict. I think this theorizing is highly relevant to what might be how we might consider engaging women in political settlement theory and practice. I think one of the things that's required is a shift to affirm agency as a deliberate, um, as a deliberate shift. Um, and I think that comes hand in hand with public recognition of the costs that follow from conflict for women, um, as well as the highly politicized emphasis on protecting women from sexual violence and other harms. I think there's little doubt that the Women, Peace and Security agenda in particular has had important symbolic and practical benefits for women, and some of those benefits are being reaped in the political settlement arena, meaning there's a cross <coughs> fertilization of claims coming from WPS into a political settlement. Um, but when the only gendered move is a move to protective policy, politics, then what we're losing is the broader imperative of inclusion, participation, and action. And it's holding on to inclusion, participation, and action, uh, which is critical to not ceding political settlement power to male actors. And um, I think agency analysis, of which we, I think, have an insufficient amount, deepens our understanding of the intersectional roles that women play during conflicts and, uh, and, and violence, as victims, as participants, as, stand as bystanders, as combatants, and I think complicates our understanding of female engagement in um, and the experience of sustained conflict or fragile state settings. It also brings a broader set of political and military interests to the table, re redefining military and female space in the process. And I think there's something critically important about redefining. It's not about getting in, it's about redefining ourselves as we come into that space and holding on to that. And so with more nuance, at least as a starting point, it's not an end point, but at least as a starting point, if there's a more nuanced understanding of the complexity of roles that women play in conflict in fragile setting, uh, we're better placed to speculate about how women will be engaged in political settlement process. And we start to literally just chip away at those gender orders, which for me is the starting point of doing this bigger piece of transformative work that would get us to political processes that more fully uh, reflect um, women's lives uh, in the process of political negotiation. So. So, thank you.